Welcome everyone to a new chat. Uh, today I'm talking to Steven Adler, primarily regarding his research on gravitational theories. We did have some audio issues during the recording and I'm gonna put a link in the description that contains a timestamp for when most of the audio qualities were resolved. Nevertheless, I published the entire interview so that you can watch it in full length if you want to. Um, please enjoy the discussion. We're going to focus on your entire realm of research, and right. I think a good story. The last point year or two, the last year or two, I started as a particle physicist, so I'm right. known to people basically for work in part high energy physics, anomalies, a neutrino reaction stuff of that sort. I haven't worked on that for quite a while now. Well, the last few years I've been working in cosmology and astrophysics. Growing out of work, I did in the last two decades on quantum foundations, basically, where I had some ideas on what a pre-quantum theory might look like, which are summarized in a Cambridge book I wrote in 2004 called Quantum Theory is an Emergent Phenomenon. And a number mm -hmm. of years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, I decided to look at what happens when you put gravity in, because I don't know uh, the basic equations for my pre-quantum ideas, but when you put gravity in, that started a whole new program of looking at a different model for the cosmological constant and then various implications for that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing now is for the last two years is following up this other program. Mm -hmm. What made you change to those aspects? Because they're quite different if you're if you're comparing like high energy physics to. Oh, well, the problem with high energy physics is there's no data. Basically, the mm -hmm. LHC is not producing any clues as to where we go next. So I've written, I've had ideas on grand unified theories on composite models. There's no way of getting a clear idea of what to do. Whereas mm -hmm. astrophysics is bringing in a lot of new data and a lot of surprising data. So that seemed like a better thing to work on since it grew naturally out of this paper I wrote about 10 years ago, eight or nine years ago, putting uh, a metric into my pre-quantum ideas and then getting an idea that suggested a different model for the cosmological constant. And that's taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. partly the fact that it grew out of earlier work you know, so my research tends to grow in, in, an organic, in an organic way out of previous things I've done. But right. it's partly that and partly the fact there's a lot of interesting data in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we focus on the, the research you've done specifically in astrophysics, would you say the cornerstone of that is trace dynamics? Or would you put the cornerstone somewhere else? I feel like that's well, perhaps the central thread. The trace dynamics came because when I looked at what trace dynamics said about the induced action for gravity that has no derivatives of the metric. And since in the trace dynamics things I was working on, there was this vile scaling invariance, which means that you can replace the metric by a function, a scalar function times the metric, and the action is invariant. And when interpreted, when what that says, if it carries over to the induced action for the non-derivative part of the metric, the induced action for the derivatives in the metric is, the, is not, does not obey this invariant. It's the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is force space general coordinate invariance and is not a vile scaling invariant. But there's no law, at least as far as I know, saying that the cosmological constant part of the action and the Einstein Hilbert have to have the same uh, symmetry properties. Maybe they're different. The standard mm -hmm. assumption is that the cosmological constant has the same symmetry properties, in which case it's a vacuum energy, and there has to be this enormous transient of vacuum energy from all the particles up to the Planck scale down to 10 to the minus 1 20th of the Planck scale to explain why the observed cosmological constant is so small. But the, Cosmological constant action has no connection with vacuum energy. Then it could be something totally different. And while you still have to explain why it's so small, there's no uh, fine tuning problem anymore because the smallness mm -hmm. makes something coming out of a deeper level of physics, but it's not a, a weird cancellation to one part in 10 to the 120th. Mm -hmm. So, this is, what got me interested in astrophysics things was coming from trace dynamics and seeing that it suggested a different action for the cosmological constant part of gravity. The mm -hmm. original action is the invariant volume element that's 
equivalent of the metric, period, integrated over four space. This action is the square root of the, of the over g zero zero squared, where g zero zero is the time time component of the metric. Um, the property of this action is that if you scale g zero zero by any scalar function of position, the, the denominator gets multiplied by that function squared, but the invariant volume element square root of g is multiplied by that same scalar function squared also, so it cancel out. And this has different invariance properties from the einstein hilbert action. It's not four-phase general covariant, it's only three-phase general covariant, and it singles out a preferred frame, which the natural assumption I make is that the rest frame as the cosmological uh, microwave background of the CMD. So it's a very different picture. It's compatible with the C plus one formulation of relativity, which is what you use to get dynamical equations for relativity for black holes colliding in that kind of a state. You can't, you can't do that with the four space form of relativity. When they do black hole colliding, they use a four relation. That's a different form of relativity. One. And my cosmological constant ideas fit neatly into three plus one, but not into the original four. So then I've just been pursuing various implications of this new cosmological constant action. Now the reason it's not ruled out immediately is that in the uh, zeroth order cosmological constant model, before you put in small fluctuations, g not not is simply one. So it doesn't matter if you divide the the volume element by g naught naught squared. It's a, it limits the uh, vacuum energy. But when you put in small fluctuations, it has very different properties. Okay. Okay. What is the background for, for taking these two approaches? So we have the, the first action, the traditional action, let's say, and then this updated version. What led okay. to the divergence between the two? What was the thing well, that caused sort of this investigation to begin? It's the issue of the invariance properties of the underlying relativity. If you say that the Einstein Hilbert, if you say that four space general covariance is mm -hmm. the consideration, then it has to be Einstein Hilbert, which obeys that, plus the original cosmological constant that Einstein introduced and dismissed as a mistake, but it turned out it's very there in some, at a very, very low level. Mm -hmm. But that, as I say, implies this enormous cancellation of vacuum fluctuation energies between the bosons and the fermions coming down from the Planck scale through the grand unified scale down to particle physics and much lower, which seems mm -hmm. kind of weird. And that's where all this stuff in string theory calls the landscape, that there are 10 to the 500 different vacuums, and we happen to live in one of them. I think that's unlikely to be true, okay? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, now, other people have invented other actions, for example, for the cosmological constant. For example, uh, Turek and Steinhardt, in it. yeah, have, uh, I think, as Steinhardt, I think it's with Turek, have the tracker model for the mm -hmm. Those seem to be ruled out now by the most recent experiments to say that the cosmological constant, so within 20%, is constant over within around 5%, 7%. It's constant over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my model is in that uh, spirit, though, because it says forget about the vacuum energy. It may be something totally different that looks like a vacuum energy in the standard cosmological model. And the standard cosmological model has g naught naught equals one up to very tiny corrections, like 10 to the minus five, one in 100,000. Okay. So this mimics the energy, vacuum energy version up to high accuracy, but then it makes different predictions. Mm -hmm. And that's always interesting. When you have what Steve Weinberg called a foil to your current theory, it's a way of testing your current theory. If your current idea, if you only have one model, you're not really necessarily confronting it. If you have two models, you can start looking at the differences between them. And then right. that, even if the new model turns out to be wrong, 
at least it tells you that you've got some evidence that the original model is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that was what got me interested in originally, not as doing new astrophysics. But I said, okay, this is interesting. It's a, a mimicker of the standard vacuum energy model for the cosmological constant. Therefore, it's a foil to test whether the standard one is right by looking at the predictions of the new one and seeing, do you see them? Are they correct or not? Or what, what do you verify? Right. And what are the things that you would verify? Where do well, these what, models diverge? The, Okay, the first thing I had to do was the new action, because a lot of people said, okay, you're going to get scalar gravitational waves. And scalar gravitational waves are not seen. What are seen are transverse gravitational waves. So I worked through the learn the perturbation theory to test that. And it turns out just having the three space general coordinate invariance without the four space invariance is enough to rule out scalar waves. That in fact, in the original theory with four space invariance, there's sort of a bit of overkill. You've got two different conditions that rule out the uh, scalar waves. Here, there's one, one condition. But if you work out the scalar waves you've, in the minute cosmological action, you find that you, the uh, equations are inconsistent, that the amplitude has to be zero. So yeah. that was the initial thing, was just going answering this objection. Then when the Hubble tension came along, I worked out the theory of that, and it does predict a different value for the most recent measurement of the Hubble expansion, but it's dependent on an initial value parameter. It's not a real a priori prediction. It can be mm -hmm. fit, but not predicted in advance. It determines the value of this parameter. And right now I haven't been able to figure out whether I can generate a different prediction or how to for what's called the sigma A description, uh, discrepancy, the clustering discrepancy. I've been Would you mind articulating that. what that is or giving some background to that? Well, I don't, not an expert in that. It says that galaxy, that matter in the current universe cluster less than was expected on the basis of the uh, standard model. And that's really all I know. And I've read a bit about it, but I don't see a natural way yet to link my ideas to the calculation of that. So I haven't mm -hmm. been able to extend the testing from cosmology of my cosmological constant model to get, try and get one additional number, which should give an actual test rather than a fit of something. Mm -hmm. But the other thing my model did, since there's a one over G naught naught squared in the action, that suggests that G naught naught can't vanish because then the action would become infinite. And that mm -hmm. alters black hole properties in a very significant way. So with Fatih Ramazanoglu, he was a Princeton student who did a pre-thesis problem with me, and then a thesis in a numerical gravity with Franz Pretorius. After we finished, it was a postdoc back at Princeton. We collaborated at working out what a black hole would look like with my cosmological constant action rather than the standard cosmological constant. With the standard cosmological constant, the black hole looks essentially the same up to a new horizon at extremely large distances and at astrophysical distances. With my action, it eliminates the horizon because at a horizon, G naught naught vanishes and then G naught naught becomes negative inside the horizon. With my action, there's no vanishing of G naught naught. It remains positive. Mm -hmm. And so that launched a whole new line of investigation, which is what would be the consequences of black holes having no horizon. Now I'm going to drink right. a bit of water. <laughs> do that so the next thing I did this is on after the paper with Fethi was to understand the difference between event horizons and what are called apparent horizons and I got some nice results on apparent horizons in their uh, symmetry group and then look at the data from Fethi, and that shows that there's no apparent horizon. There's no event horizon, no apparent horizon in this modified black hole. So it really doesn't have a horizon at all. Okay, there's mm -hmm. no disconnect to it. There's no causal disconnect inside. That suggests that maybe it plays a role in galaxy formation. See, in the meantime, very recently, in the last two years, they've seen that just about every galaxy now, it's believed, has a humongous black hole inside, a supermassive black hole. Mm -hmm. Like 10 to the six in our galaxy is four times 10 to the six solar masses, four million. 
In some galaxies, it's 10 to the eighth or even a billion solar masses. And that suggests to me, at least, that the old model of galaxy formation, which is that galaxies are formed by a lot of small proto galaxies colliding and merging, may not be right. Maybe the black holes inside, if they don't have horizons, then things can come out. See, the lack of an apparent horizon means not only the things fall in, but things can come back out, which mm -hmm. they don't if there's an event horizon or even if there's an apparent horizon. Well, they do, well, you, they do according to Hawking radiation. Oh, or maybe I have that. Maybe I have yeah, that. no, Hawking radiation is at an extremely low level. Right. Un undetectable for these massive objects. There's mm -hmm. quantum effects produce radiation. Right. But we're talking about an hyperscale here of. Yeah. In the new model of cosmos, if, if there's no horizon at all, then things could come out at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. Things could fall in and just go right through. Right. And so that suggested that maybe I should look at galaxy formation models based on the idea that galaxy formation is actually uh, triggered, I would put, catalyzed by the presence of black holes. Because we know that mm -hmm. galaxies are much more massive than the black holes inside. In current, the current universe by a factor of about 2,000. Now they're finding in the early universe is a smaller, much smaller factor, sometimes just 100 which again suggests to me that the black hole forms first. Let me mention that the idea of the black hole forms first was suggested two decades ago by a postdoc in Michigan, a Dutch astrophysicist named uh, Vestergaard, and her papers are referenced in my papers. So it's not a new idea. People have wondered for a long time, which came first, the black hole or the galaxy? And she interpreted some early data saying maybe the black holes came first. So I want to give credit there. But there wasn't a theory for how that might happen. Well, now, if there's no horizon, that's our suggesting model. So maybe particles coming out of the astrophysical black hole and particles falling in collide, and that creates turbulence. And I now also have an argument that maybe also that could result in a cooling of the matter, the gas outside the supermassive black hole based on the following idea. Then if a particle falls into the supermassive black hole, where the density is a lot higher, it can lose energy inside. So it reemerges, even though the time, the red shift of the blue shift of energy falling in is canceled by the red shift of energy coming out. If it's lost energy inside, it will come out with a lower transverse motions and therefore a lower temperature. So mm -hmm. a astrophysical black hole, if it has no horizon, but just has a fine high density of matter inside in the normal state, which I'll talk about, could act as a little refrigerator, cooling the gas outside and making condensation into stars much more likely. Because mm -hmm. the big obstacle to star formation is a high temperature in the gas. And if you look at the genus criterion for when you can get at a gravitational instability to form a star, basically you need a low temperature and a high density. The high density uh, gives you more gravitation, and a low temperature means that the pressure of the kinetic motions doesn't counteract the gravitational attraction causing mm -hmm. collapse. Mm -hmm. So my idea in the latest paper I have, which is submitted, I hope I'll eventually get it published, it's called Revisit of My Original Model of uh, Gravit Stars. I'll talk about Gravit Stars soon. Mm -hmm. contributing to black hole formation and the jet Webb telescope. The web, it predicts a couple of things. It says that the Webb telescope should see lots of early supermassive black holes as they come first. And that the new galaxies, the early galaxies should be much smaller in diameter, even if they're heavy, big in terms of mass than current galaxies, because the density of hydrogen in the early universe is higher. And this mm -hmm. collision model says that you have to have basically a high density outside, that the density outside the black hole, the density of, 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 of hydrogen gas outside the black hole is what reduces the size of the galaxy to within right. an order of magnitude or so. So that's the evolution of the ideas. I went from saying there's a one over G naught naught squared in the cosmological action that I'm looking at. That says that even in the absence of matter, there's no horizon. If there's no horizon, that suggests 
that there could be an active role of these astrophysical galaxy, uh, black holes in galaxy formation. Then the then this branched in another direction because I said, okay, the cosmological constant is very small. Let's see what happens when you put matter in and look at the models people have made where there aren't horizons. There's a model going back to Amor Matola and Maser called the Gravistar. And it's mm -hmm. in their papers, which go back about 20 years, and also is written up in a, cha a chapter of a book by Kamen Sint on, uh, on compact astrophysical objects, a quite recent, re more recent book. Mm -hmm. And what they did was to suggest that there are several layers in what they're seeing out there, and that there's a the a phase transition inside to a state where the density plus the pressure sums to zero, which is like what you get from the cosmological, the original cosmological constant of vacuum energy. Mm -hmm. And a Russian physicist named Gleiner had a long time ago speculated that that's maybe the state of matter inside a black hole. So the idea was to use the Gleiner state. The one thing that they did that I thought was not right was that they put in dialed in radii where the transition occurs. And I looked at that and said, well, you know, if this is really true, it has to be just another uh, compact astrophysical object. So I started reading up on that. And there's a, like a one, there's a big book of Zeldovich and uh, Weinstein. I hope it's Novikov. I have I always have to remind myself. Anyway, Zeldovich has a book, uh, Stars, uh, Relativity and uh, on astrophysical relativity. And the first book is on star formation, galaxy, star formation. And most of it's on a discussion of the different phases of matter. Right. And at the end, he says, well, maybe the final phase is the relativistic gas, which I agree with, the almost final phase. But he also has a one page discussion of what are called the TOV equations, the Talman Oppenheimer bulk of equations, which were derived in the 30s. And it's a quite remarkable calculation because you derive them just for the Einstein's general relativity plus matter, matter as uh, just an ideal gas, and then manipulate it a bit. And, you, and the relativistic generalization of the standard pressure equilibrium equations take a very simple form. That's the density of short style black holes that there's no phase transitions, but you can put in changes of phase. And that's what people do when they discuss neutron stars. So I looked at those equations and said, well, I should take Amos' idea and redo it through the TOV equations. And when I did it, and on using, in the meantime, Fethi, my uh, Princeton student who did a pre-thesis problem, I found that when he was working with Pretorius, I thought he'd be doing his calculations on a big mainframe. He wasn't, he was using Mathematica mm -hmm. for the whole thesis. And so we did our analysis of black holes in Mathematica. Mm -hmm. Black holes is modified by the, uh, new dark energy action. So I did was, I, and during the summer in Aspen two years ago, I programmed in Mathematica the TOV equations with a phase transition uh, where the pressure jumped. I found that like the equation was generally a hatch. Then I looked at the equations and saw that the TOV equations require the pressure to be continuous. It's very much like the junction condition for maximum equation, or the argument that for the Schrodinger equation that the potential is bounded, the wave function and its first derivative have to be continuous. It's a sort of pillbox argument. Mm -hmm. So the TOB equations have an equation, the pressure by the radius is something that's bounded. As soon as you integrate that, you see that the pressure at R plus minus pressure at R minus is the integral from R minus to R plus of something that's bounded. As R minus approaches R plus, that goes to zero. Therefore, the pressure has to be continuous. What can jump is the density. You see the density always appears on the right-hand side of the equations in TOV. So the density can jump. So I reprogrammed things putting in the density and jump and immediately got these beautiful black hole looking things with however gene will not going to zero. It becomes exponentially small at the surface, the nominal horizon inside. So I call this a dynamical graphic star. The radii where things change are now come directly out dynamically. So it's following from an action principle, unlike the original Gravistars where the radii were dialed in. Mm -hmm. And you basically just solve the TOV equations with a density jump to a state with negative 
energy density. Particle density is a negative, but the energy density has been known since the 1980s when you try and put quantum corrections into the stress energy tensor and regularize to get the quantum infinities out, that you can't prove positivity of the energy density anymore. That's been known for a long time. As soon as you put that the TOB equations as a initial radius condition, you find you get something that looks like a black hole, that simulates a black hole, but isn't really a black hole. It very accurately mimics the Schwarzschild metric outside and inside the G naught naught becomes exponentially small. And so you can get huge time delays. So that's basically this, what I've been working on now is aspects of the TOV equations with a jump to negative, with a phase, a phase transition inside. And I should mention some other names. The Matola, what Matola did was also worked on by other people in a less specific way. There are papers of, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of papers referred to in my articles where people speculated that there's a phase transition. They were basically doing a condensed matter analogy. And so the idea has been around for a long time. There's some sort of phase transition of matter when you go beyond the relativistic matter energy or density, that then it jumps to a different phase. And if you say that that different phase is one plus with pressure plus density and approximately zero, but with the energy density jumping rather than the pressure, you get something that looks like a black hole but has no horizon. And what do we what do we mean when we say that it looks like a black hole besides the horizon? Well, so what I mean is that the where, exterior, where do you draw that? Uh -huh. yeah, okay, please go ahead. You you get a surface. It's approximate now. It may be one part in a billion that looks like the surface of a black hole. Outside the metric is very close to the Schwarzschild metric. So all the standard calculations that people do with the exterior Schwarzschild metric are valid. The light sphere, which is what they see in the event horizon telescope, the orbits, everything is just like a standard black hole up to a higher accuracy than you can measure now. Basically relativity mm -hmm. around stars is measured around this, of orbits and stuff is measured to one part in 10 to the four, 10 to the five. Here you get, it looks up to one part in 10 to the nine, it looks like a black hole. But as soon as you go to the surface, you find the metric instead of G naught naught, instead of developing a zero, it just becomes exponentially small. And when mm -hmm. you go and stuff, by small, I mean 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus 20, really yeah. small. Yeah. yeah. And then that means there are huge time delays. It means that matter falling into a hole could reside there for a long time before it comes out. And there is mm -hmm. some evidence, there's an astrophysicist named Yvette Sendes at Harvard, Astrophysical Center, Smithsonian, Harvard Smithsonian, who has articles about long time delays between the uh, optical and the radio radio signals. And that's still being explored. So there may in fact be evidence for these long time delays, but the fact that things can get back out also, as I said, that gives you a possible mechanism for galaxy seeding by the stuff that comes back out having a lower temperature and that can collide with the stuff falling in. And mm -hmm. scale of several collision lengths, which are basically the collision lengths of hydrogen, which approximately give you the right dimensions up to about a factor of five or six, the dimensions come out reasonable looking. Mm -hmm. They can cool the gas and make it much more likely the stars form. Mm -hmm. You have to have an explanation of why, do, if you look at all the galaxies that people image, especially the spiral ones, you see this diffuse structure extending over many orders of magnitude. And then you go towards the center, you see a bulge and it gets brighter and brighter. And the dead center of the bulge, there's this huge black hole. It seems yeah. to me very improbable that that black hole comes from merging of, merging of smaller black holes. If so, I would expect that once in a while you see a humongous black hole orbiting around the geometric center of the galaxy because the galaxy is much heavier. Mm -hmm. But you know, they're all in the dead center. To me, that suggests they must play a causative role. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the whole research program I'm working on now is to looking at the gravid stars, or I call them dynamical gravid stars to distinguish from Engel's original model. I don't dial in the radiative transition. I just put in the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action plus an assumption of a phase transition in the equation of state. The Einstein-Hilbert action gives you the TOV equations. I said we ignore the cosmological constant. If you put it into the mathematical programs I wrote, it has a minute effect because there's one part 
it's a it's down in the error of the computation. So in the newer right. work, I just left the constant cosmological constant out, which simplifies the analysis a great deal. You get a much simpler set of TOV equations. And then I just put in TOV plus the assumption that there's a jump in a phase transition inside from relativistic matter to a equation of state with negative energy density. And then that has a lot of interesting consequences. Now, one thing I haven't succeeded in doing, I haven't tried very hard. I've been busy with all this stuff trying to get it published in a coherent way. But right. what we like, there's a limit to what you can do with the numerical stuff because uh, if you want to trace something down to one part in 10 to the 10th, it's beyond the accuracy of what you can do. I can, if I, in my model, I have the density plus the pressure is a small positive constant. If it's zero in the TOB equations, there's no evolution at all. It is very small. It's what's called the bad constant. So I have pressure plus density. It's almost the Gleiner equation of state, but the sum is equal to B and B is positive. When I get beyond a B of 10 to the minus three, the mathematical program stops working. It just doesn't have the accuracy, even though it's mm -hmm. got a high accuracy, to resolve what's going on. So I would like to get an analytic approximation to the TOB equations with this dump to negative energy density. And that's an open problem. It's something I'll probably work on, start working on in the next couple of months. But if anybody who's listening has expertise in nonlinear equations and sees a good way to do it, by all means, jump in. You know, it may be some kind of a generalization of WKB ideas. I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something there to be disentangled. If you look at the latest paper I have on archive, the, on Gravistars, the first two are now published in PhysRev. The latest one I submitted to physics letters B and haven't heard back. And I'll start prodding them because I want to actually extend the calculations a bit. But the latest one just looks at the exterior equations, assuming a boundary condition and an inner, inner boundary of a sufficiently negative accumulated energy density. In other words, you start from a, the TOV equations involve something called M of R, which is the mass accumulated inside. If you start with that sufficiently negative, you get these things that simulate uh, black holes without even saying what the interior equation of state is. So it says it's really not very dependent on the exact form of the interior equation, whether the bad constant is 0.1 or 0.01, or whether it's a slightly different equation of state. All you need is this negative uh, accumulated energy density at an inner surface, and then you integrate TOV equations going out. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting mathematical problem just to get an analytical form approximation of that, a good right. analytical approximation. Mm -hmm. Do you have any view on how difficult that might be to attain? Like if we're talking timelines regarding this, do you see it as something tractable that you can get over? And it might, it might be. Uh, it, it might be. I'm. The answer is uh, I don't have a lot of expertise in working analytically with nonlinear differential equation systems, which can do complicated things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it's a simple thing that you can get a good approximation to or whether it's a difficult thing. Uh, an example is quantum chromodynamics. There, a long time ago at Sviparan, I numerically solved, and then we did it some analytic work also, a model called the uh, savity uh, pagels Pambulis model for confinement, which is you simply start from a Lagrangian that's not it's a Maxwell Lagrangian, but with an extra log. So it's E squared minus B squared log E squared minus B squared. Okay. And what that does is to form a free boundary and give you something that looks very much like a bag confining quarks. It would be a nice quark. So that can be analyzed totally. Originally, people didn't believe that that can find. I went to a conference in Russia and, Russia and started talking about the Savvy model and the elder, elder Migal got up and said that it's no, not the confined. And I said, I'll prove it confines. At the end of my talk, he said, well, the problem is you have too many models of confinement, which may be true. You know, there's the stringy models, which probably are more active. There are uh, people can do very good simulations, but nobody's gotten a rigorous proof. That's one of the clay problems in mathematics. Mathematics has been outstanding for 20 years. I don't know, a long time. So yeah. I don't know how hard it will be to get a good analytic approximation to this TOV equation with a strange boundary condition. It may be 
like what I did with C, that there'll be a good approximation that's not perfect, but quite good that you can do in a few months or a year. Mm -hmm. And it may be this just a, a hard 20 year problem. I have no idea. Hmm. You know, uh, Stephen, yeah, we have yeah. two, two minutes 50 left to go. So I okay. think we need to start wrapping up here. I would just like to ask you before we do, if there's anything else you would like to say before we close the interview, any any requests to the wider audience? Um, well, like that? I have a lot of papers on the internet. If you look on our archive, you'll see my papers. The ideas are out there. Anyone is welcome to jump in. I'm working on this, but I'd love to see other people start to work on it. Okay, great. Well, with that then, I think here we need to close it because, well, we're going to get cut off. Okay. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much for... Uh, okay, for sure. thanks. This was fun. I appreciate it too.